Mallory likes Dimmit is a Berkeley graduate, class of 1994. She also currently serves as the executive director for the Florida Wildlife Corridor. This morning, she's talking to us about connecting to keep Florida wild. So the Florida Wildlife Corridor is a statewide vision to help keep Florida wild. And this vision was inspired by a fellow Berkeley Prep graduate named Carlton Moore Jr. It's his photographs I'm going to be sharing. He had the idea to bring this vision to life by undertaking conservation treks that we would document through photography, film, and writing, and then share for the purpose of inspiring the corridor's conservation. It's not every day that you get asked to go on a conservation trek inspired by this guy, the Florida black bear. So uh, Florida black bears, there are seven different subpopulations in the state and estimated to be around 2,000 to 3,000 bears. Um, and there's a research project undergoing, this is in South Central Florida, to understand the black bears' movements, exactly where they travel and what um, kind of lands they cross and what impacts uh, their, their migration and, and movement. So, this particular bear is named M34. He went on a 500-mile walkabout from South Central Florida near Lake Okeechobee all the way up to Interstate 4. You can see from the dots on the map um, that the bear actually sends through the radio collar in the previous slide a text message of his location to the researchers every 15 minutes. It's pretty great technology. And this bear, like I said, in a two-month period, walked over 500 miles in a 100-mile span from north to south. And as he reached the interstate, he was very close to Orlando, who's actually in the town of Celebration, couldn't get across the interstate, hung out in Celebration for a couple of days before returning all the way back south to near his starting point. So again, if, the, if a bear could walk for 500 miles on all connected natural habitat through the center of Florida, perhaps humans could too. And what's the purpose of doing this? Well, if you look at this map, you can see uh, in red all of the lands in Florida that are currently developed. This is a little bit out of date, so it's grown a little bit since. Approximately 1,000 people continue to move to Florida each and every day. But if you look at this map, you can see it's concentrated on Florida's coast. And again, this is the map in, in 2060. So that growth is pretty dramatic. I'll do that one more time. This is the map currently today. We have just surpassed uh, New York as the third most populous state, 20 million people, projected to grow to 35 million people by 2060. And here you can see that all of the green conservation lands are almost surrounded entirely by development, so becoming islands in a sea of ongoing development. There's long been a practice in a study in Florida of how to connect conservation lands in some sort of reserve design in order to allow connectivity among uh, wildlife populations and other uh, services. And so the uh, folks Berkeley Prep Inspired did not come up with the original science. We were the ones to, to say, let's bring that to life. And we wanted to bring it to life through, like I said, a conservation trek. So this is a GIS map of the uh, Florida Ecological Greenways Network showing the statewide Florida Wildlife Corridor. And then a red line of an idea to walk 1,000 miles in 100 days from the Everglades to the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. And by walking, I have to let you know that most of Florida is more liquid than you think. So uh, that walking quickly became paddling and also sometimes biking. And so, uh, like I said, four explorer friends, we set out on a thousand mile journey. This was in early 2012, and we started in the, in the Everglades. Um, and here at this point is kind of where the mangroves of the outer Everglades give way to the river of grass. And that's when I knew we were entering sort of the liquid heart of Florida's interior. And we would go several days without seeing people. I'm going to take you now on a really quick journey because this is only 10 minutes, so I'm going to go pretty fast. But we did work our way onto some of Florida's dry prairies. This is Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park um, in South Central Florida. That's one of the um, holdouts for the most endangered bird in all of North America. The Florida grasshopper sparrow can be found here in this prairie. We worked our way up the Kissimmee chain of lakes to the Everglades headwaters, which starts near Orlando. Um, and we crossed over into the St. John's River watershed and paddled north or worked our way on foot north through um, all of North Florida all the way to the Suwannee River where we paddled upstream for four and a half days to get to the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. And so at the end of that journey, we produced a book and a film, a lot of media about the, this trek in order to raise awareness for it. But 
at the end of every great adventure is always when you hatch your plans for the next one. So as you can see in the map shown on here that we ignored most of Northwest Florida. In fact, roughly half the state was left out in our first conservation trek. So I spent the last two and a half years working on a vision that would tie from the first trek the rest of the Florida Wildlife Corridor all the way to Florida's western border with Alabama. And um, we set out on this trek uh, earlier this year. So January 10th, we launched from the Everglades headwaters or the midway point of our first trek. We had a much more of a following this year. We were an official Explorers Club expedition. We were met at the launch by Florida Senator Bill Nelson and friends and family. Um, and although we set out to start in a landscape that we had come through last time in the Everglades headwaters area, just again outside of metropolitan Orlando, when we started this time, this is what it looks like, the same landscape. So again, you know, Florida's growth growing really quickly. We, it was very difficult in the planning of the track to even find a place to cross Interstate 4 as Orlando and Tampa continue to grow together. So we could relate to the struggles of the black bear. He wanted to turn back. We went through underneath the cattle guard and into the green swamp on the other side. The green swamp here is the headwaters of four of Florida's rivers in central Florida. Um, and one of the coolest experiences I've ever had was part of this check is setting a swamp on fire. You might wonder, you know, what's the point of that? But um, all along, this was a demonstration of, of important land management tools and partnerships in, in a greater um, community of practice for land management in Florida and um, sustainability. So fire is an important tool. We were then worked our way to Florida's Gulf Coast, to Chazowitzka, Crystal River, and even up and around the Crystal River power plant. So this was an 18-mile paddle day where you could see this uh, power plant um, visible for the entire paddle that day and even further on the horizon line <clears throat> from beyond as we you know, went through the land of banities and worked our way up Florida's nature coast. We had stretches where the biking actually turned to walking and carrying your bikes, um, but all part of the adventure, again, we... Every, every time we were working our way north, we wanted to go out west to see the Gulf Coast um, at certain key points. And so this is Cedar Key. Cedar Key, one of the places where the survival of the human community really depends on the survival of nature. So they're intimately tied together. The, the um, balance of water quality and enables the economy there to persist. Working our way further up the nature coast, now we're just south of Tallahassee and our trail ran out. So there was one point where we literally had to swim across uh, the river at the end of a footpath. It was pretty cold, and if you remember, this year we had a record cold and wet winter, and so it's about, water's about 50 degrees in this picture. I did not pause for long, just kind of kept moving. And so here, as we keep moving, we're now looking at Apalachicola National Forest, just west of Tallahassee. Um, and we entered one of the great swamp tromps on the Florida National Scenic Trail. It's a 1,400 mile long trail maintained by volunteers and in a whole community of folks um, that is you know, on par with any of our other national trails of recognition. And at this point um, in the Bradwell Bay Wilderness area, the trail really becomes the water and the water becomes the trail. So we're actually wading uh, knee to chest deep in, at times um, through this section. And after we moved our way west through Apalachicola National Forest, we spent five days paddling down the Apalachicola River all the way to the town of Apalachicola. Again, another place where uh, the survival of a human community and the economy that, is, that community relies upon is in, almost entirely dependent on the balance of nature. So the balance of freshwater coming down from Georgia and Alabama through the Apalachicola River to the bay that it, that balance is what allows us to continue to be productive. We spent time with a third generation oysterman who taught us all about tonging for oysters. Uh, it's harder than it looks. I tried it, it was not very successful. It would take me a long time to make a living oystering, but I'm very appreciative of the experience. And as we worked our way even further west across Florida's panhandle, here we're walking in a tree, a field actually of restored longleaf pine trees. Um, this is the 53,000-acre Negosi Plantation, and the two gentlemen here, um, one of them, the late M.C. Davis, had the, had the vision to restore the landscape here back to what would have been here. So longleaf pine used to cover from Virginia all the way to Texas. 
over, um, you know, was a single dominant type it is now less than 3% of its original range. And so this is a 200 year vision to restore this landscape. But in this picture, the trees are only about 10 years old, so just a little bit over head high. And it really is a, a commitment um, on a large scale to bring nature back. And as we pass from that private land onto Eglin Air Force Base, so you know, going from a private land to a federally owned and managed 460,000-acre um, base, we went across underneath this um, wildlife passage. And this is the first place that I know about that there is a wildlife underpass connecting private land to federal land. So it's precedent setting, and we walk through it just like wildlife would be able to under a really busy road that is, of course, being expanded, bringing uh, tourists to the beach. And one of the most impressive things about Northwest Florida were the incredible rivers and the tannin-stained dark water rivers, and then really how much we don't know about life in Florida's rivers. So in this photo, it's hard to make out, but there is a, a giant fish here named the alligator gar, who is really um, a prehistoric fish, essentially. This one is probably about... 70 to 80 years old, they can live to be even 90 or, or years or greater. We captured this one, Annette, brought it on board, tagged it, um, again, to, just like the bear, to understand its movements in the underwater realm that we can't see, um, and took DNA and other data from it. So I had the pleasure of lifting this fish up. It weighs about 63 pounds, and then trying to get it back into the river, sliming myself and the team in the process. But it was pretty exciting. So at the, at the end of this 1,000-mile 70-day journey. We went from Glades to Gulf, from the Everglades headwaters all the way to Gulf Islands National Seashore, again on foot, uh, by kayak or by bicycle. And uh, we're excited that a film is going to be coming out shortly about this experience called The Forgotten Coast, which is uh, another name for part of this region, but I think really elusive of the fact that there's so much about Florida we don't know or we've forgotten. And um, so we invite you all to be a part of uh, watching this journey um, through the film, which will premiere in the Tampa Bay area November 12th at the Tampa Theater and then on broadcast television November 19th. And then it'll be available beyond um, audiences out across Florida and, and around the U.S. on PBS. So we're in the process also of creating a, a second book about the journey that includes all the writing we did from the field and the, and the photographs of Carlton Ward and others. And then last but not least, I want to help share the message of how we can all help keep Florida wild. And so there are a number of options here on this card. I think one of the most important is to think through um, the maintaining of Florida's agriculture. Agriculture is a very compatible use with wildlife and conservation. And so in order to keep Florida's agriculture strong, what we can each do is buy products with the Fresh from Florida label in the grocery store. The next thing we can do is to help advocate for land and water conservation funding. A lot of you may know that uh, last year, Amendment 1 passed with over 75% of the vote to allocate funding for land and water conservation in Florida, but it's up to the legislature to put that into the budget and make it happen, and that's where we can all come in. Um, we can also, much like this expedition, get outside ourselves, uh, reunite with your favorite place to go in the out of doors, take someone with you on that experience, and most of all, share it and help inspire others. And if you're not willing to do that for yourself, please share our story and help that be an inspiration to others to help keep Florida wild. Thank you very much.